This panel is called, as you can see, Latinx Programming in the Midwest. And one of the things that I had hoped that we would be able to do is talk about our work in our different institutions. So we are welcoming uh, Bill Johnson Gonzalez, who is uh, a Chicago native and graduate of Brother Rice High School. He's taught in the areas of US Latino and American studies at Harvard and at Wesleyan. And now he's associate professor and director of the Center for Latino Research at DePaul University in Chicago. He's also the editor of Dialogo, which is an interdisciplinary studies journal. Um, Dr. Gonzalez is here to um, speak to us about his uh, work. And I'm going to just pass it on to you. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, Professor Lucia Suarez, who's been a friend for a long time, but who I also greatly admire uh, as being you know, one of the people that you meet when you're in graduate school, who inspires you and sort of keeps you, <laughs> keeps you around. Um, so it's lovely, after all these years that we've known one another, that we can still look at each other and say, wow, we're still standing. <laughs> we, we've made it. We've made it to tenure. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the folks who, that, uh, especially Lucia, who organized this, but everybody else who helped organize uh, the event. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Um, we were asked, so I actually have a full paper, so apologies if I uh, uh, am reading uh, for most of this. Um, we were asked as members of this panel to discuss the histories of the Latinx studies programs at our various institutions. Um, and as I reflected on that assignment, I became increasingly interested not just in telling a history of measurable growth, but also in trying to articulate the set of factors, some perennial and some newly emerging, that have both enabled but also conditioned and constrained the various shapes that Latinx studies has taken or has been able to take at DePaul University where I work. In other words, I'd like in this presentation to identify some of the specific material, historical, situational dynamics that have accompanied the gradual institutionalization, growth, and from certain points of view, contemporary challenges that face Latinx studies, both at my institution and more generally across the country. I want to dwell in those moments of pressure that seem to have shaped or are shaping our program, moments in which challenges have been encountered or in which things seem to be shifting, moments that have a determining impact. Here's an image. Imagine two force fields surrounding and containing a turbulent flowing particle stream. Think the Rio Grande in the border. That's one metaphor here. Um, each field of power has unpredictable intervals of intensity or weakness that can disturb, promote, and otherwise direct the flow of the stream. The stream itself has moments of surging and recession that can also impact the force fields. In the course of this presentation, I'd call one force field a set of faculty powers. If you could show the next slide. This is um, not the Rio Grande, but another way I thought earlier this morning when I was doing a PowerPoint and before I came up with the idea of the Rio Grande, maybe an asymptote would be the way to do it. <laughs> But the idea is that there's, uh, you know, the, an asymptote is a sort of mathematical idea of uh, uh, a line that is constantly approaching another curve, but they never actually hit. So it's just sort of moving in that direction. So, you know, one force field, let's call it faculty powers, ideals, dreams, ambitions, desires that our program asymptotically approaches. We never quite get there, but we aspire toward it. Another force field, and I didn't have a map of this, but imagine sort of another curve going in the opposite direction here, underneath here. Um, the other force field I'd associate with demographic, economic, political, and institutional constraints, which also form their own sort of curve that influences the path of our programs, whether we like it or not. The particle stream itself is Latinx studies, which flows on like the Rio Grande, taking its shape and revising itself both through its own momentum and in response to these competing forces. I don't think I'll have any masterful conclusions yet about where our Latino studies stream may be heading, but it's always healthy to begin to take stock of patterns when you notice them. And by arriving in a sense of where we are now and how we got here, I hope to provide some illumination or even just some things to think about as we consider where we might want to go from here. At DePaul, we actually have the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies and a Center for Latino Research. So these are two distinct and independent entities. Could you show the next slide? So this is the web from the web page that shows the Latin American and Latino Studies Department. Next page. Could you show the next slide, please? Um, one of our faculty members, Lourdes Torres, edits uh, the journal, which is called the Latino Studies Journal. Next slide, please. 
Um, I'm the director of the Center for Latino Research. I've just become the director in winter of last year. This, we're kind of playing around with the possibility of a new logo for the center, um, and I wasn't able to uh, load a, a GIF <laughs> into the PowerPoint. Um, but one of the issues, of course, is that now there's a kind of raging debate about are we Latino, are we Latinx? You know, um, I actually tried, proposed to our board to change the name to the Center for Latinx Research. Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley has already done this with their center. Um, and a linguist uh, at the institution told me that that was, quote, imperialist. So um, I, I don't think I agree with that particular argument, but uh, it also made me realize that I don't think we need, as a center, to legislate a term. I think maybe the problem is that we fixate on static terms. So if you actually visit our webpage, which is go.depaul.edu forward slash CLR for Center for Latino Research, you'll see that we've now created an animated GIF that cycles through various possibilities uh, continuously. So it's actually moving, right? So here you have Latina, Latino, uh, Latino with a, a butterfly, <laughs> a mariposa, which is a sort of sign for migrants. If you can show the next slide, please. Uh, Latine, which is the gender neutral uh, suffix uh, on the word that is used more popularly in Latin America. And then finally, Latinex. Um, in telling the history of Latinx, oh, can you show one more slide, please? Sorry. I just also wanted to talk about the journal I edit, Dialogo. So the Center for Latino Research has its own journal, a separate journal, um, which is actually an interdisciplinary journal of Latin American and Latino studies. Bizarrely, the Latino studies uh, journal is published by the Department of Latin American and Latino. And the connection between Latin American and Latino is part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the Center for Latino Research publishes an interdisciplinary Latin American and Latino journal. Does that make It's a bit mismatched, but there you go. OK. Um, in telling the history of Latinx studies at DePaul, I'm conscious of the fact that I may potentially be representing challenges that are encountered at a different kind of institution than those of my colleagues on this panel. They're all at larger public institutions, but DePaul is private, urban, and Catholic. We are also a teaching institution patterned after the model of a small liberal arts college, and importantly, we are almost entirely tuition driven. The mission of the institution, which I think is truly central to the university and to the ways in which my colleagues conceive of their quotidian professional activities, involves an emphasis on the poor, on social justice, and on helping disadvantaged communities find sustainable ways to improve their lives. Next slide. Thus, 60% of the student, oh, I think we're one ahead. Can you go back one? Yeah. Thus, 60% of the student body attends the university, that attends the university by, uh, sorry, 60% of the student body attends the university while receiving some form of financial aid. 30% of the student body is made up of first generation college students, which in this case is actually strictly defined as families in which neither parent has a college degree. The number of first generation Latinx students is even higher, 42%. Many of our students are also from immigrant families and are themselves first or second generation Americans. Indeed, I'm surprised at how even the white student population at DePaul is deeply marked by Chicago's immigrant history. I've had countless Polish, Irish, Bosnian, Lithuanian students in my courses who readily identify with elements of Latinx immigrant experience. Um, in my experience, Latinx students are typically themselves or have close relatives who are immigrants, um, but those trends may also be changing uh, in Chicago in terms of the new demography of Chicago. Latinx students constitute 19% of the overall student population at DePaul. This represents a healthy 5% growth over the last five years, but a whopping 30% growth since 2009. 19% sounds like a good number, but the city of Chicago, depending on who you ask, is somewhere between 25 and 29% Latinx, I keep telling our dean. So our enrollments do not yet fully reflect the diversity of the city. Moreover, of the 846 Latinx students in the current freshman class, 585, or 69%, are not from Chicago at all. They're from suburbs, other parts of Illinois, or out of state entirely. So while this creates a diverse Latinx population, I also sort of wonder to what degree we're actually sort of bypassing the local community, right, uh, for in favor of a kind of a larger kind of diversity. Latinx enrollments have been holding pretty steadily and outstripped those of the other racial minority groups, as you can see here, um, at DePaul. 
And some of my colleagues in the Office of Institutional Diversity and Equity have speculated that we will soon become a Hispanic-serving institution, the threshold for which is 25% of the undergraduate population. But honestly, should this occur, it will probably be more the result of natural demographic growth than targeted recruitment by the admissions office. Since the university, and this is all super secret, but I've come to learn, um, is forced to balance right, the uh, applicants with financial need right, with applicants who can pay tuition. An aside, while the Latinx student population continues to grow, the numbers of Latinx faculty have decreased significantly over the last five years due to retirements and loss of faculty to other institutions. Not only does this create a serious dearth of Latinx faculty resources for students, but it also points to heavier burdens for advising among the remaining Latinx faculty, especially for those who are pre-tenure. Because you, know, you get older, you don't have to worry about things that are taken seriously anymore. Um, I wanted to provide this general demographic picture of our Latinx students because at a place like DePaul, given the current crises of funding for higher education in general, and the humanities in particular, enrollment flows are paramount. Faculty are hired and retained, and thus programs shrink or grow based on the number of students that a program is able to serve. When I began at DePaul, the Latin American and Latino Studies program had only four full-time tenured faculty and one junior faculty member. Two of the tenured that no hold on. Two of the tenured faculty later departed for other institutions, but only one of their lines was replaced. As is typical across many institutions nowadays, when faculty leave or retire, the university approves only a non-tenure track adjunct line if you get anything at all. I am not counting myself in these numbers because my appointment is in the English department. I'm affiliated faculty with Latino and Latin American studies. So there's 30 affiliated faculty, right? Um, so a saving grace is that other departments like English or political science might unexpectedly hire someone to contribute a course to the program, but it's difficult to build a program without being able to guarantee if and when courses that you're gonna have to have students take, right, are gonna be offered in any given year. It would be grossly inaccurate to say that Latinx students take, uh, are the only students that take our classes. We serve the entire institution. But it is totally accurate to say that majors and minors in Latin American and Latino studies have been almost invariably Latinx students. In 2007, when I began at DePaul, the major attracted about 15 to 20 students annually. But that number has dropped to about five students in the last three years. Our minor programs, nevertheless, have remained robust at about 40 students. However, as I shall discuss later, con competition from a variety of new interdisciplinary programs like criminology, I fear, may slowly erode the numbers of students the department can attract. When I investigated the concentrations of Latinx students across the university, I was not surprised, given the demographics of our student body, to find that the vast majority of Latinx undergrads are concentrated in the business school. Could you show the next slide? 25% in the business school. You're, this is not going to make much. It's just raw information that I pulled from our website. But um, it shows you know, there was a high point of enrollment in 2014. It's gone down. It's kind of going back up again. But if you compare liberal arts and sciences to things like the business school, we see a disparity. right? So the business school, 25%. The College of Science and Health, 19%. The College of Digital Media, 18.5%. The College of Arts and Sciences, 15%, ranks fourth in attractiveness. The College of Arts and Sciences used to be part of or joined with the College of Science and Health um, as the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, right? But the university induced a split in 2011 to create a lucrative new College of Science and Health. As a result, we went from being the largest college in terms of enrollments to the fourth in size in the institution. The creation of the new college successfully attracted more students, but the institutional effect has felt like a diminishing of the centrality of the liberal arts. And while we used to have a substantial number of double majors in psychology, which is now in science and health, psychology and Latinx studies, that particular combination has now become more difficult because students have to cross-register across colleges. Similar challenges exist in cross-listing upper-level courses with the College of Communication, which is also in a geographically different part of the city. Um, ironically, as interdisciplinary programs have matured into more organized fields of study, this is an actual point I want to make, bureaucratic barriers have now grown up that impede greater interdisciplinary collaboration. Right? Next slide. 
We have a visiting professorship at DePaul that is generally held by you know a well-known public intellectual. Maria Hinojosa, host and creator of Latino USA, uh, occupied that position from 2013 to 2019. And this winter, Erica Sanchez, novelist and author of I'm Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, will begin teaching at DePaul. Um, I bring her up because Maria Hinojosa, who is a journalist, a famous journalist, harder to find a more prominent Latina journalist, regularly struggled to get journalism students from the College of Communication to enroll in her courses because the College of Communication wouldn't cross-list the courses and allow students to get credit because there is competition to keep student credit hours within the college. These bureaucratic boundaries, I would argue, affect the kind of Latinx studies program we can become. Although one might dream, for example, of a program that produced skilled Latinx journalists educated within and exposed to the dynamic media ecologies of Chicago, and equipped with a rigorous humanities background in Latinx history, literature, and politics, structurally, that's becoming quite difficult. Students have become limited to engaging Latinx studies courses in our college primarily through liberal studies or general education courses, and professors in LALS wind up teaching courses, course loads that are heavily weighted to introductory courses, since these are the courses that are guaranteed to fill and to keep the department afloat. Am I doing OK on time? Sorry. The titration, I'm about halfway through, so I'm hoping I'm all right. The titration of enrollments and faculty lines is, I'm sure, a familiar feature to all of us in the contemporary neoliberal university, which typically values programs because they are revenue generating and which often seeks to promote multicultural diversity, not for social justice reasons, but primarily as a commodity that prepares students for engaging in the global marketplace. This is, I'm quoting George Udice's article on this. Still, I would suggest that a tuition, at tuition-driven institutions, smaller interdisciplinary programs are unfairly victimized by metrics based on these measures. At DePaul, the mission of our institution has helped to protect the program. Nevertheless, there has been downsizing, as I've indicated. And even with the university's continued support, the perennial challenge remains of how to recruit more undergraduate students to major and minor in Latinx studies in a climate in which the traditional humanities are devalued as a source of practical benefit for employment, and where articulating the connections between the humanities and those other seemingly more attractive fields has been made more difficult by institutional barriers. So far, I have striven okay, to give a snapshot. Just shut me up whenever you want. <laughs> I have striven to give a snapshot of one side of the power field around the particle stream, how demographic and economic factors based on student enrollments have exerted determining forces over the size of our program. Um, although the humanities may be suffering some lean years, we're actually just coming down from the boom years of the 90s through, the 20, through 2010, where at DePaul, at least, enrollments were sky high and the in university was expanding in multiple directions. Um, in the next part of the presentation, I'd like to consider other forces at play, like the unique vision and planning of our faculty, which have also shaped our department. Our current department was begun as a program in Latin American studies in the late 1970s. So it was only Latin American studies. It came together as a, when a small group of faculty with interests in Latin America created the program out of the courses they were teaching. It was interdisciplinary in the sense that students took courses from several single discipline based courses. But overall, the program was heavily weighted toward history and modern languages, although students were required to take geography and cultural anthropology, one course each. The first restructuring occurred in 1983, when two courses each in history, geography, and poli-sci were mandated, and a first core course in history was created, literature dropped out. The minor and study abroad programs appeared at this time, but although enrollments were strong, faculty research leaves utterly compromised the ability to deliver required courses in the program. So either you taught the entire time and did no research, anyway, you get it. A separate entity, originally called the Center for Hispanic Research, uh, was established in 1985 with a mission to connect faculty research with the surrounding Latinx community. The journal Dialogo was founded in 96 to publish faculty research alongside community contributions in a glossy magazine style presentation. Could you use the next slide, please? So this is Dialogo, the early years. You can see it's a little bit more kind of a magazine-y kind of look. Um, since then, in 2012, uh, Partially because of various pressures, Dialogo has become fully peer-reviewed. I mean, it's in some ways, great. It's what the academic quality has gone through the roof, but you can also sort of see that the connection to the community has been severed, right? It is now fully peer-reviewed with an external and advisory board and is published by the University of Texas Press. So again, academic success, departure from original vision. 
1992, when the university was experiencing growth and a boom in enrollment, the program was again restructured. The required courses in more established fields like history were reduced, and students were allowed to select courses from an extended list of approved classes. Faculty drafted a new mission statement rejecting the traditional approach based in geography and envisioning the program in more diverse cross-national terms. Finally, the program was renamed Latin American and Latino Studies. In 96, the program developed three new fully interdisciplinary core courses originating in the program, one of which was called the Construction of Latino Communities. By 2001, the program hired its first faculty member. Now the program had five core courses, all interdisciplinary in nature. A self-study and growing enrollments led to the hiring of two new full-time faculty, one focused on Brazilian and one focused on indigenous studies. In 2014, the program successfully changed its designation from program to department, somewhat independently of enrollments. It was just the sort of sense that it was now time to be a department. What I notice in this narrative is an overall dramatic transformation from a program based initially in Latin American area studies, defined by national and historical specificities and disciplinary specificity, to a much more diverse interdisciplinary program now heavily oriented toward ethnic studies. Um, if initially scholars had to argue for the necessary relevance of courses about US Latinos, now the reverse argument may have to be made about Latin America, which feels like it's receding in the curriculum. I don't know to what degree the transnational component can be effectively taught in one class, which also has the burden of covering multiple Latinx groups in a 10-week quarter. Many of our Latin Americanists who were around in the 80s have retired, and those who have been led, uh, who still remain, have been led to transform their teaching, since courses on Latinx studies will fill, but traditional courses on Latin America will be under-enrolled. Um, our curriculum is being driven, uh, is sort of student-driven in another way here. I mean, partially what I'm saying here is that enrollments are driving what kinds of courses people can offer, right? Repeatedly throughout the last 40 years of the program's existence, faculty have argued for the broadest, most complex, comparative, and inclusive vision of Latin America and Latinos. When hiring someone to cover Brazil, we chose someone who studies the Arab community in Brazil. Uh, Camila Fojas, a brilliant scholar of Latino film, also works in Asian American studies. Recent hires have been around Central American studies, film studies, gender and sexuality. The appeal of the new has always kept the program intellectually vibrant and evolving, and I would argue that diversity was also a mandate for the program to remain open and welcoming to the great multiplicity of our student body, which includes an unpredictable mix of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian, Guatemalan, Peruvian, Brazilian, and increasingly now Venezuelan students, and interethnic interracial mixtures of all of the above. Resolutely, the program has always articulated itself as Pan Latino. DePaul was, in fact, one of the first programs to call itself Latino Studies, as opposed to Chicano Studies or Puerto Rican Studies. Um, there are, so I'll conclude with this point. There are pros and cons to this. Diversity, complexity, and openness to new paradigms are, of course, a major asset. But having been trained in Chicano studies myself, what feels like the continued lack of institutionalization and simple visibility of the word Chicano in Midwestern curricula strikes me as unfortunate. As commentators like Francis Aparicio have suggested, one strength of Latinx studies programs in the Midwest has been this emphasis on greater Latinidad. But as she also articulated, it is this tension between the specificity of each group and the need to see ourselves as a collectivity with common analogous experiences that characterize the dynamic of Latino studies. Um, we do an excellent job of talking about the emerging collectivity, yet it's always depressing to me when students show up in my classes completely unaware of the word Chicano or of the activities of the young lords uh, and the role of Latinx in the Midwest in the Chicano and Puerto Rican civil rights struggles that have occurred throughout the 20th century. Since many of our students end up in our classes as a way of exploring their identities and acquiring a historicizing relationship to their lived reality, um, these are students who are being raised in, a, I'm sorry, the, the coursework itself, this is my point, the coursework itself has to help them navigate the constantly evolving connections between the facts of the historical past and the emerging collectivities and frameworks of the future. So I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. Um, can I just show a couple more slides real quick? Um, here's, you know, uh, these are, people don't recognize that there was a Chicano movement that happened in Chicago at one point. <laughs> I mean, it was a surprise even to me, having grown up in Chicago, to return to find this kind of historical reality. The next slide as well. 
uh, we did a, a 50th anniversary of the Young Lords Symposium at DePaul uh, last year, but also kind of trying to call attention to the local history of Latinx in the Midwest, and you know, especially in Chicago. So thank you for your attention. Welcome to Dr. Lawrence LaFontaine Stokes. And on his web, like there's so many things I can say about him, but I pulled up something from the web and he says he's better known as Larry LaFontaine. He is a gay Puerto Rican author, scholar, and performer. He's an associate professor of Latinx and American studies at the University of Michigan. He has been the director of Latino, Latina X studies for how many years, Larry? Because you just stepped down and now Maria Cotera has it. But how many years were you at? at six full years. He was a uh, director for six years. And he's the author of numerous books. He's, uh, he's also the co-editor of Keywords. So if anybody's needing a good book for their classroom, Keywords is it, right? We want to give that a hand. Um, he's also the author of Queer Ricans, Cultures and Sexualities in the Diaspora, A Brief and Transformative Account of Queer History, Uñas Pintadas de Azul, for which he has received several awards. And he has a forthcoming book that we're all anxious to see, but we'll, we'll give him a hand now for his work as a as director. So thank you so much for, for hosting me, for having me. I'm very excited to be in Ames. This is my first time um, at Iowa State. I'm very excited to be here. I want to thank uh, Lucia Suarez. Uh, I want to thank Brian and Megan, uh, USLS. That's a new acronym to me. Of course, John, a round of applause for John for all the technical assistance. <laughs> My presentation is going to be quite different, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more informal and more structured around the PowerPoint. It's a little bit more descriptive about what is uh, Latina, Latino studies at the University of Michigan. Um, it is fair to, to note that the, the student preferred term right now in Ann Arbor is Latin X that the program has not shifted to reflect that. In fact, there's still debates about whether the X is here to stay, uh, what the X does and what it does not do. Um, I am open to the X, but I am also excited uh, to continue to use Latina and Latino or Latine or anything else. Um, so I am no longer the director of the Latina Latino Studies program. I served for five years from 2000 2011 to 2016, and last year I was acting director. So um, I'm speaking to you, um, and I'm going to be sharing a lot of information. Um, and a lot of this information is actually available on our website. So in a certain way, what I am doing is I am sort of walking through the website, walking through a lot of information, or pulling lots of information that is available, because what you're going to soon see is that the program at the university the University of Michigan is quite unlike the pro program at DePaul. It really uh, is more centered as a type of ethnic studies program um, located in a department of American studies. We do not have a center for Latinx research. Uh, so, and of course, we are a large public university, which every day seems more and more private uh, given the budget cuts uh, at the, at the the state level uh, with, a, with a university with a very strong fundraising so that in many and 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 rising um, tuition so that the, the socioeconomic profile of the students every day is wealthier uh, but at the same time the university tries to be responsive to its historic mandate as a land-grant institution as a public institution in the Midwest an institution that has over 40,000 uh, students in the southeast corner of Michigan. So I invite you to look at our website, which probably has a lot more information that I will be able to share with you today. Uh, and then I'm, so I'm kind of doing something like trying to look here and also click over here. So uh, the Latino Latina Studies Program at the University of Michigan was established in 1984. So we're not quite as old as the programs that got established in the late 60s and early 70s, but at the same time, we, we are fairly old. We're 35 years old. We are located in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, which is the largest college at the University of Michigan, um, where there are 19 colleges. And one of the challenges 
challenges and benefits of being at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I should point that out uh, because the Dearborn and Flint campuses, to my knowledge, do not have Latina, Latino studies. Um, being in Ann Arbor in a school with 19 colleges uh, and, and um, schools is like, how do you create, how do you bring all of these people together? Uh, our main pedagogical mission is for the students in LSNA. That's the, that, how we refer to the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. But of course, we do have undergraduate and graduate students from the professional schools, whether it is social work, medicine, education, nursing, public health, art and design, music, theater, and dance, who routinely engage with us, and not only students, but also faculty and staff. That is uh, what makes the program so rich, but also one of the challenges at a famously decentralized campus where many people do not talk to each other. So part of my experience being director of the program for six years was simply uh, increasing communications. How do you bring together, how, how do you let people know that there are things going on that might be of interest? Because my experience in my early years there was a recurring sense of frustration that nothing is going on in Ann Arbor. And the fact is that there were things going on, perhaps not that many, but the biggest problem was that nobody knew what they were. So they were, they were happening, happening discreetly across the university. So simply increasing communications uh, was a key to increasing a sense of community, to increasing the sense that while we might not be that many, the student, the Latino, Latinx student population in Michigan is 5%. Uh, so it is not as large as it is at DePaul. Uh, Latinos, freaks, uh, students, faculty and staff, frequently feel invisible on campus. Uh, so maximizing our possibilities for connection is crucial. And this has especially happened post uh, the election of Donald Trump with the rise of racist incidents on campus, which led the students to feel that being Latinx was not simply about their social lives or their extracurricular activities or their fraternities and sororities, but it, it, that it really had to be about making a visible statement on campus in a campus where there were decreasing numbers of African American students after the banning of affirmative action in Michigan in 2006. So our campus has lost a dramatic number or percentage of African American studies since affirmative action was banned in 2006. So in this context, in a context of open hostility towards uh, historically underrepresented groups, how do Latinos somehow increase their visibility, especially in a state that really thinks of the world in black and white terms. So in Michigan, or at least at the University of Michigan, people seem to understand uh, that there are African American people and that there are white people, but everybody else is sort of a mystery. Or so you would think uh, from the way that the institution reacts to the needs and the specificity. So how do you widen people's sense of what is going on? So Latina Latino Studies was established in 1984 in the back then program in American culture. So it was a program inside of a program with a director reporting to another director who then reported to the associate dean. What is fascinating is that the Department of American Culture would then become the home to three additional ethnic studies units. Uh, initially, Asian Pacific Islander American Studies, then Native American studies, and most recently, Arab and Muslim American studies. As you might know, Michigan has the largest concentration of people of Arab and Muslim descent in the United States, so it is logical that there, the student, there was student interest. And what this means is that um, we interact with each other, we talk with each other. Sometimes people work autonomously, actually most of the time, but sometimes, fortunately, we do try to do joint programming. We try to do um, 
mixed curricular offerings. Uh, students inevitably talk to each other, faculty talk to each other. So as opposed to the conversation between Latin American and Latinx studies, which does occur at Michigan, but not through the Department of American Culture. So at the University of Michigan, there's a separate center for Latin American and Caribbean studies in the International Institute with no budgeted lines. I don't know the exact history of that. So many of us do Latinx and Latin American studies, but in our program, I should say in our department, the Department of American Culture, which is the oldest department of American studies in, in the nation and, and the world, we really envision the potential for cross conversations. And the fact that African American studies is not in our department is by virtue of the history of the institution, the formation of a separate center for Afro-American and African diasporic studies, which is in the same building. And in fact, some people really do try to bridge the division between being on the third floor as opposed to the fourth floor. Uh, but, but it, 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 it marks, it marks the work we do. So American culture was established in 1935, but became dormant from 1943 to 1948. Um, in fact, this history was lost until recently. Most people believe that our department had been established in the 1950s. It was only by going through course catalogs from the 30s that people rediscovered the history of the department. It is the oldest American studies program in the world, although uh, Harvard University claims that they are older than we are. Um, the university origins uh, are indicated on the website of the Department of American Culture, specifically how our department acknowledges the university's origins in a land grant from the Anishinaabeg, including Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, and Wyandot, and how we further acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. Knowing where we are neither changes neither the past nor the present. However, through scholarship and pedagogy, we work to create a future in which the past is thoroughly understood and the present supports human flourishing and justice while enacting an ethic of care and compassion. This statement is actually quite recent. Uh, so are the the increased awareness of the need to recognize the historical specificity at the University of Michigan, the, the violence committed on indigenous people, the repatriation of human remains in the university museums has really raised awareness in a campus where there are actually very few Native American students, even though Native American students can go with for very low tuition. As you see from this image on our website, the website suggests that African Americans, well, it indicates African American studies because the African Americanists felt excluded or felt uh, at a loss as to where they are because there's a separate department. The other four ethnic studies units are the ones that are technically housed in our unit. So in our department, what we have is more of a caucus of people who do African American studies, many of whom are jointly appointed with uh, DAS, or the Department of Afro-American and African Studies from their website, which you can see established in 1970 as an interdisciplinary program of research, instruction, and community research. So I think that that, that is a tension, a productive tension, and it is interesting to continue to tease out the relationship of Latinx studies and the other ethnic fields um, in, at the University of Michigan, and of course, as a, as a broad field itself. Many of the discussions precisely about what are Latinx studies, what is Latinidad, or what are the multiple Latinidades are precisely about the place of indigeneity and Afro-diaspora, uh, the, the exclusions within the Latino Latinx community itself. So uh, a number of years ago, we decided to, well, our department uh, encouraged every unit to brand itself or to create a logo so that we could give out stickers, um, swag, 
t-shirts, easily visually communicate. And as it turns out, one of the junior faculty also has a PhD in industrial design. Um, so Professor William Calvo Quiroz, um, he designed our logo, uh, the logo of the hummingbird. Um, and I have a, a slide about that. Oh, that I've been showing. See, that's what happens when I am I'm trying to do two things at the same time. I'm clicking on my computer and I'm clicking on the clicker. Uh, okay, so here is the logo of the Latina Latino Studies program. The hummingbird design reflects a migratory bird that exists across the Americas and the Caribbean. In choosing a logo to represent our program, we thought about the role that hummingbirds have played in legends and myths in various American traditions. This includes the Zapoteca legend of the pájaro arcoiris as the orange of the rainbow and the colors which we interpret today as representations for diversity. In the design of our hummingbird, we selected the violetear species of hummingbirds that can be found from South America to Canada. We believe that this image serves as a symbol of the many Latina Latino populations who similarly move across great distances and national divides with equal beauty and dignity. So I had mentioned um, the focus on Latini, well, la the conception of Latinidad or Latinidades that is in place in our program is very expansive. And it has been expansive since the origins of the program in 1984, uh, in part because there have always been Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in Michigan. So there was no dominant group. It always made sense, or at least from terms of the faculty and the student and the staff needs to have an expansive viewpoint. So historically, the program has had very strong representation of Chicana, Chicano, and Hispanic Caribbean scholars, but not of Central American scholars or students, and very little representation, formal representation of South American, perhaps with specific exceptions of individual faculty, for example, uh, Professor Eliana Moya Radio from Chile, who in the 1980s and 90s taught the Latina women course and really focused on the experience of Chilean women, for example, Arpillera, um, who were doing uh, the resistance to the dictatorship. I am um, running out of time. Uh, I have run out of time. So it seems that pretty much that is what I would get to tell you today. Thank you very much. This panel exists because of a conversation I had with Silvia Martinez at the Latino Studies Association conference last uh, summer. And rather than take up more time, I'll tell you that story in person. But let's welcome, uh, oh, let me introduce you properly, right? Let's, let's not rush so much. She's the director of Latino Studies program and associate professor at Indiana University Bloomington. She has written intensively on topics of race, ethnicity, and education, and she's the co-author of the new publication, congratulations, right? Uh, understanding the Latinx experience, developmental and contextual influences. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. Thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation, and it's been a great uh, visit uh, so far, um, and delighted to share a little bit about what we are doing at uh, Indiana uh, University. Um, I realize that we are th the Latino Studies program, uh, and we have not had conversations about the X or an adding an A or, <laughs> but I, I might start those. Um, so we are, yeah, Latino Studies uh, at Indiana University. Um, and we are, part, we are a standalone program in the College of Arts and Sciences. So we do have our own budget. We offer an undergraduate minor as well as a PhD minor. And we have five uh, core faculty as well as one visiting assistant professor um, and many affiliate faculty. Um, I want to start um, by sharing, how does this work? Okay. Uh, I want to start um, the presentation by sharing um, 
last week's activities. I'm still on a high. Um, so I just finished uh, my tenure as director of Latino Studies at uh, Indiana University. But my last act of as director was seeing um, this pro programming activity uh, to light. So last year, I sent out an email uh, to Dolores Huerta's um, agent uh, inviting her to our campus. And to my surprise, she accepted our invitation. <laughs> so this was my last act as director, is seeing this ac activity through. And so for those of you who don't know, um, Dolores Huerta is a civil rights icon, right? Labor activist, co-founder of the United Farm Workers uh, Union, along with Cesar Chavez. And really, she hasn't gotten her sort of due, um, what do we call it? Oh, I'm, uh, recognition, right, for her efforts. Um, and we had screened the documentary Dolores by Peter Bratt in 2018 as part of our film festival. And so in a dinner with Peter, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great to have Dolores? Yeah, send her an email, and that's what, what I did. So last week, um, Dolores Huerta was on campus. Um, I wish I could say I planned it to coincide with our 20-year anniversary, so Latino Studies turned 20 this year, um, and also the university is cel celebrating its bicentennial. <laughs> um, I did not plan it that way, it was just serendipitous, <laughs> but it was part of our Latinx uh, Heritage Month celebration. Um, so I start here to give you an example of what Latino studies at Indiana University um, is capable of, of doing, um, despite our modest operating sort of programming budget. So we dedicate about $10,000 a year for programming, but we typically put on twenty-five dollars to $30,000 worth of programming every year. So that means we're making up you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars every year. So that's a large part of. Um, I felt like a large part of my duties as director was grassroots organizing in the way that um, Dolores advocates is um, bringing people together to pitch in a couple hundred dollars <laughs> or more to make these um, program programming activities um, happen. Um, <clears throat> but. But also this event, I, I underestimated what her presence meant for students. Um, I booked the largest venue I could afford on campus <laughs> um, and prayed that, that I would fill it. And, and I did. Um, we actually had to shut the doors after more than 400 people showed up and came to find out over 200 waited outside and never were able to get inside the doors. So standing room only. So I underestimated um, the importance that her presence um, on campus had for our Latinx uh, students, but I think it goes back to what uh, Memo talked about in the keynote, right? It, the political climate is, is ugly, it's messy, and, and I think the Latinx students needed, needed someone to inspire them. Um, and that's what she did. That's what she did. So I'm thrilled that, yeah, this was my, my last act as, as director, but I show you some pictures just to show you what, what we do, what we're um, uh, capable of, of doing. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about our history. So when I was hired in 2006, um, I knew, you know, t we're, we're told a story, oh, we were founded in 1999, founded in 1999 by Jorge Chapa. Um, but it turns out that the idea for a program dates back to about the 1970s. And here I want to credit the work of uh, newly minted PhD, Dr. Stephanie Wessel, who led um, undergraduates Nitsa Duran and Diana Ar uh, Archivalia um, on some archival work on this. So some of these, these slides come from, from their work. And this was through an independent study for our undergraduate research symposium in, in 2017. Um, so it turns out the, the idea for the program came as a result of an ugly incident on our campus. So it was a, it was a grievance um, 
uh, put forth by two undergrads. So two undergraduate students taking a Spanish course um, in the Spanish and Portuguese department were called uh, morochos by an associate instructor. And morochos is a derogatory term in Spanish used to describe people with dark skin. So upset by the racist remark, um, the two students filed a report of grievance. This was in 1973, uh, and presented this to the chair of the Spanish and Portuguese um, department at the time. And in the, in the report, um, right, they outlined uh, what happened, right, the specifics of the complaint, um, and reference affirmative action policies, um, but they made recommendations. So what they wanted to see was more training for um, associate instruction, associate instructors, any uh, staff, uh, faculty, uh, the development of a Latino studies program. Um, they wanted uh, more Latinx students recruited to campus. Um, so a variety of, um, I'll say demands, <laughs> recommendations. What, what resulted uh, immediately after the grievance report was the creation, well no, what resulted immediately was uh, Spanish professor Luis Davila started offering a course called um, the US Latino. So it's a course designed for the US Latino. So this was the immediate response, uh, but he also created a program called uh, Chicano Riqueño Studies. And this was a program to try to compare the experiences of uh, Mexican and, and Puerto Rican uh, populations in the US, likely the two largest populations in the US um, at the time. And the program was housed in the Spanish and Portuguese uh, department, and as it turns out, all the courses he offered uh, were in Spanish, and that becomes problematic. <laughs> um, it becomes problematic for a lot of the Latinx, uh, Chicanx students taking the courses, um, and kind of goes back to the panel on uh, Spanish for heritage um, speakers. Um, many of those students find, found themselves being criticized for their Spanish right, their, their dialect. Um, so, so this is where then um, we, we have more conversations about developing a Latino studies program, right? Let's offer courses in English that, that speak to the identity issues of Latinx students of the time. Right? So on top of the uh, creation of the Chicano Riqueño Studies Program, the administration also creates the Office of Latino Affairs. And the first associate uh, dean of the Office of Latino Affairs is Horacio Lewis. Um, and this is where um, the history gets a little fuzzy. <laughs> um, conversations from uh, staff who were students at the time suggest that there was just a lot of uh, ego, a lot of um, sort of ideological differences about what a Latino studies program should look like, what it should offer. Um, Horacio Lewis, for example, was interested in developing a Latino studies program, but also eager to recruit more uh, Latinx students, um, have more training for faculty. Um, and citing lack of support from our administration, Lewis resigns in 1977 after serving for, uh, what, three or four years in that position. So uh, between like 1973 and, and the late 80s, you see turnover in this position in terms of dean of this office of Latino Affairs. And f as I'm, I, I didn't dig into the archives, but, um, Dr. Wessel tells me, again, just a lot of fuzziness and sort of, it's not clear, right, what the goal was, what, what were the anticip or desired outcomes, right? And so if you don't have desired outcomes, it's hard to work towards a particular uh, goal. Um, the one good thing, though, is that during this time, um, 
La Casa or the Latino Cultural Center um, is created. That was in the early 1970s, um, and they recently celebrated their 45th year anniversary. Um, so that that is the good part, but we still don't have a Latino Studies uh, program. So it wasn't, so I, for the students still in the room, um, student protests <laughs> makes things happen on college and university uh, campuses. Um, so it wasn't until 1997, uh, several student organizations come together. So it seems like a Latinx student organization, African American student organization, Asian American students come together, create a coalition, and they take over the vice president's office. And um, they make several demands. They want to see the creation of a Latino studies program. They want uh, the recognition of Martin Luther King um, as a holiday, because it wasn't a holiday at the time. They want an Asian American uh, cultural center. They want the university to provide LGBTQ plus services. So uh, a long list of demands that you probably can't read from the little <laughs> picture here. But it was this student protest that finally led to the creation of the Latino Studies program. So following this protest, um, turns out administration uh, does an external search for a program uh, director. And so that takes me to 1999 to, to the present. Um, and so this is the history that I always knew. Oh, Jorge Chapa, uh, the late Jorge Chapa created the program. So, but it turns out it was an external search. They hired Professor Jorge Chapa. Um, and so he is the first official director of the Latino Studies program. This is in 1999. He offers um, a course called Latinos in the US, Past, Present, and Future. Uh, an undergraduate minor um, is created, and it looks like between 1999 and, and early uh, sort of 2005 or so, he, create, he puts a lot of courses on the books. A lot of those courses carry um, historical and social distribution credit. Um, he hires a visiting assistant professor, relies on associate instructors to deliver um, uh, this um, this programming. Um, and this is also important to note that this is a time, right, 2000 to 2010, the Latinx population in Indiana is growing exponentially. Um, and so he, he saw a need, right, for this, this programming and, and developing um, these courses. So uh, he hires John Nieto Phillips, I believe, in 2005. He hired me in 2006. Um, he hired me a month later. He decides to leave <laughs> for Urbana-Champaign, uh, I believe, to uh, direct a center uh, there. Um, and so after Chapa uh, leaves Indiana University, Professor Arlene Diaz um, is director for three or four years. Um, and I want to give her credit for establishing our PhD minor. Uh, so she pushed the proposal uh, through the process. And she also had the um, foresight to take us through a faculty learning community to develop learning outcomes for our minor. Um, and I really enjoyed that experience, and it turned out to be so valuable because last year, the College of Art and Sciences requested that every unit in the college develop learning outcomes for their minors and their majors. So we had them. <laughs> we had them uh, ready. Um, after Arlene uh, Diaz, um, then John Nieto Phillips was uh, director. Um, and I give him credit for developing the programming, programming activities for, we, for which we are now known for. Um, so I have a picture, uh, a slide here uh, from three of the four film festivals we've hosted. Uh, so beginning in 2012, uh, and John, if you know John, he's an idea man. <laughs> um, and he loves the arts, right? And so he wanted to showcase uh, Latinx culture and art and literature. Um, so he uh, hosted the first um, film festival in 
2012, then another in 2014. Um, and so when I came, became director in 2015, I was like, oh my, I have to, I have to plan one of these things. <laughs> um, and so I brought my flavor as a Latina. Uh, so in 2016, it was the Latina Film Festival, Latina Conference and Film Festival. Um, fantastic um, event. So I give uh, John uh, credit for, um, yeah, the programming activities for which we are known, film festivals, the undergraduate research symposium. We always have um, a guest speaker or panel for Latinx Heritage uh, Month. Uh, we now have essay competitions, both an undergraduate and a graduate. Um, yeah, so I give them credit <laughs> for, for developing those uh, programming um, um, activities. Um, and this is also a time when our um, credit hours are increasing, uh, despite the fact that many departments are seeing decreasing numbers of, of students in their um, courses. And part of this is a collaboration with the Spanish department. I think it was, was it Austin you talked about? getting the language and then the culture. Yes, so that's exactly what John developed. He noticed that uh, by working with the Spanish department, he talked to students and said, look, you're getting the language, come to Latino studies to get the culture. And that's, um, that's what happened is we accepted some of uh, Spanish courses as part of our minor. And so we saw our minors flourish, um, but kind of going back to well, you just mentioned College of Art and Sciences uh, tightens down on, on how you're able to get credit hours, those tuition dollars, and so students can no longer double dip. And so now we've seen the number of minors uh, decrease a bit. Uh, so those are our challenges as of late um, uh, as well. What I wanna talk a little bit about is um, sort of I, my experiences as, as director, I was really excited to take the position in 20 for 2015. After getting tenure and taking my sabbatical, I was really excited. Um, but the hardest part of my job came to be this um, initiative to merge um, the three programs, uh, Latino Studies, Asian American Studies, and Native American and Indigenous Studies. And this was, this is a proposal that had been presented to us since like the early 2000s, I think. Um, and Latino studies rejected, has always rejected it. Um, we're the largest of those three programs. We have a really strong identity on campus, partly now because of the program, programming activities for which we are known. Um, and so we were always able to push back um, against this, um, this proposal, but when I became director, um, the associate dean uh, came to, to us with the proposal, a different associate dean, um, and she really laid it on the table. I think she, think she was honest and said, look, if you don't do this <laughs> uh, with your guidance, with your input, it's going to be a top-down approach and you'll likely um, have very little resources right, distributed to you. So um, I, I, this was hard for me to digest. Um, I, I didn't want to lose our identity under my leadership. Uh, but the three directors um, decided to push back a little bit and said, this was also a time where the provost was talking a lot about um, diversity and strategic planning and bicentennial and <laughs> mission statements and so forth. So we pushed back and said, okay, we will merge or work together uh, to create a new program, but we want to call it what we want to call it because uh, they wanted to call us ethnic studies and we pushed back against that. Um, and we want to create something cool. And so to create something cool, we need faculty. So uh, we went to the provost act, uh, requesting faculty lines, um, noting that we would hire faculty of color, again, to help fulfill her mission. <laughs> um, and to our surprise, uh, or 
I guess the surprise was that she didn't, we didn't need to negotiate. She signed off. She gave us six lines, so two lines for each program. And, um, and so we're delighted. We're, we're, this is great. Um, the hard part, so this new, oh, well, I'll go back to. So the new program is called Race, Migration, and Indigeneity, RMI. And so right now, the three programs, uh, so it's a pro programs within a larger program, if that makes sense. Um, and I, we hope the vision, right, is that RMI will become a department and those three programs, right, will, will be under this department. So we are excited about the six lines. We, we start thinking about potential hires. Um, and I don't, I, mean, I didn't necessarily want to air out our dirty laundry, but, uh, but I guess to be true to myself, that's been the hardest part is the emotional labor of navigating these searches. The college has had a heavy hand in um, who we can hire, how we hire, and that, that has been the hardest part of, of my job. Um, and, and that comes back to being a program. With, as, as a program, we don't have power. Um, our faculty are jointly appointed. They have tenure homes elsewhere. So a tenure home department has to be willing to share their faculty member. So that's been the hardest part is hiring. Um, not only getting faculty lines, but then if we do get them, hiring who we want has been really um, difficult. Um, but I am happy to share, we've hired um, Son Sonia Lee, so she is a historian by training and she's in American Studies and Latino Studies. We just hired uh, Judith Rodriguez. Um, she is our Afro-Latinx scholar and that um, search was guided by student requests. Students um, wanted um, Afro-Latinx scholars, so we, we hired one, right? We, we sought one out. Um, and so she is in African-American and African diaspora studies and Latino studies. Um, Liza Black is also part of the RMI initiative, and so she is in history and Native American indigenous studies. Um, Cindy Wu. Um, is in gender studies and Asian American studies. So despite the difficult emotional labor navigating this new initiative, um, I'm really proud of the fact that I've helped bring four women of color to Indiana University. So that's a little bit about my story. Happy to chat more over tapas. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. So many things that actually we will be able to discuss more as program directors in the Midwest and probably bring in mother, other voices of other program directors in the Midwest. Um, our last speaker in this particular panel is um, Dr. Darrell Wanser Serrano. He's the director of Latina O Studies program and associate professor in Latina O Studies and the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Iowa. Um, in 2017, he received the Book of the Year Award from the Critical Cultural Studies Division of the National Communication Association for his book, The New York Young Lords and the Struggle for Liberation. Let's welcome him without further ado. Yes. So my apologies if my slides are a little bit triggering for the Iowa State University audience. <laughs> Not my intention, so sorry about that. Um, so let me start just with a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a Boricua from Washington State. There's like 12 of us or something, I don't know. There's a few more than that, I guess. Um, but I'm a first generation student, uh, 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 and first generation Latino college student uh, who uh, got, oh, everything went away. I'm a first generation student, got my, this, see, yeah, I know, it's like, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
So my, do, uh, you know, I have an associate's degree. People were talking about community college earlier, an associate's degree from Pierce College in Puyallup, Washington, which I got as a high schooler in part because my high school was too racist for me to keep going there. Uh, and so I took advantage of a program called Running Start um, that allowed me to, uh, to take college classes for free. Um, I, let's see, are we back? There's like flickering like we want to be back. Um, I have a ba my bachelor's degree is from the University of Puget Sound, a small pri private liberal arts college, and my master's and PhD is from Indiana University, uh, where I started in 1999, and I was a um, yeah I was actually I was one of the the TAs who taught the intro class there um, under Jorge. Uh, so very strange collision of worlds. Uh, currently, as was mentioned, I am director of the Latino Latino Studies program at the University of Iowa, which is, I think, the youngest program being represented on this panel. We are, I guess, uh, five years old now. Um, so my research deals with race and racism, uh, coloniality and decoloniality, um, and that's where I'm coming from. It looks like it's working, but it's not working. All right, so uh, we're gonna go on a journey from the past to the present. Um, the, so this journey goes back to the 1970s, in part because they're just, you know, the, you mentioned the archive being a little, it's that way at Iowa too. Like for example, we have no archival records that the university archivist knows of for the formation of the Latino Council, for example, which has been around for 30 years. Um, but what we do have are newspaper reports. Uh, and so in the 1970s, what we, uh, you, know, you know, coming out of the 1960s, we have a student population who is increasingly displeased with what's happening at the University of Iowa. Uh, enrollment is extremely low. There are no official numbers because, and I'm guessing Iowa State was the same way, they didn't actually collect those numbers or put them in reports. Um, but students counted because we do that. Um, and Latinos counted because we do that. Uh, and so what they knew was that, um, that you know, in 1970, there were about 20 Chicano students at the University of Iowa. Uh, and so when they started organizing uh, and pushing to form a kind of student organization and get a cultural house on campus, which all happened in 1970 and 1971, uh, they started making demands of the administration. Uh, and so we get you know, a doubling of the number of Chicano students, which takes us to about 40 uh, in 1971. Uh, we also have the formation of the Chicano American Indian uh, House Cultural Center, which still exists, uh, although with a new name, the Latino Native American Cultural Center. Um, so the 1970s were a period of organizing. Uh, students were extremely politically active. The lettuce boycotts uh, were a big kind of focus of uh, student organizing on campus. That led to a kind of increased politicization of the students and increased demands of the administration. Uh, demands such as, hey, let's have a Latino faculty member at the university at some point. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that ended up happening. Uh, 1978 the picture starts to clarify a bit because the university starts actually counting the number of Latino students and Latina students at the university. Uh, there are, you know, steady increases in the number of those students, still way below the kind of like numbers that you would expect to see given the state population. Uh, and so in 1978, the first year of counting, we have 79 students uh, who identify as Hispanic or Chicano. Uh, that's a half a percent of the undergraduate student population. 1979, it goes up again, 96 students. So, you know, hey, this is good, 0.6%. 1980, 124.7%. Um, you know, to my knowledge, there's still very few Latino, Latino, Latinx faculty at the university at this point. Uh, and to my knowledge, none actually doing Latino, Latino studies work. Uh, so from, um, you know, as we move uh, past the 70s and into the 80s uh, and into the 90s, we finally start seeing some real gains. Latino, uh, Latina students finally passed the 1% mark in 1985. Uh, and in 1990, uh, they're at 1.4%, which is actually a little bit higher than the statewide uh, population, right? 1.2% statewide, according to census data. Uh, from people who were students at the time, um, you know, people who I know who were like graduate students at the university in the 1990s, they can only recall one person doing Chicano studies work, um, a white woman in film uh, who was primarily a Latin Americanist. 
Um, there were, you know, there were Latino Latino faculty, or at least Latin American faculty, um, and there were staff. Uh, and so, in fall 1989, the Council on the Status of Latinos was founded at the at the University of Iowa, a group that, as I mentioned earlier, still exists to this day. 2000, 2010 uh, was a kind of interesting period, what I like to call a kind of perfect storm. Uh, and I call it that because we see a, a pretty significant increase in the Latina Latino population in the state of Iowa from 2.82% in 2000, according to the census, to 4.97% in 2010. Those numbers continue going up at a pretty significant rate. Um, but there's less than ideal recruitment and retention of, uh, of students and of faculty again, right? So um, again, there aren't great records of this, uh, but in talking with people, they can recall about two faculty uh, in like the early 2000s who were doing Latino Latino studies work and were, were themselves Latino Latino. Uh, one, a pretty famous political scientist who is now at UCLA, they always leave. Uh, and second, a sociologist who also left uh, pre-tenure. Um, but you know, there was slow growth in uh, in the. In the there was the the need was seen for a remedy uh, to to kind of like increase the number of minority faculty at the university. So, in 2005, the provost came up with an interesting cluster hire initiative to bring new faculty starting in 2006, uh, and that was basically we'll pay for most of the line in the first year if you hire people doing this kind of work. Is the message to the college deans, and the deans are like. Okay, yeah, free money. We'll figure it out later. Um, and so they did that. They hired, uh, the, you know, they began uh, with hiring three. They tried to hire four Latino Latino studies faculty. They hired three. Um, one of them is still there. Uh, and then I, you know, I wanted to put this here as a kind of like, you know, an in between slide uh, because you start to see like how this is going. This, this kind of slow, steady growth over the decades leading up to uh, this decision uh, to do the cluster hires uh, in 2006. Um, and then things just kind of like skyrocket, right? And there's lots of reasons for that um, that I think in big part have to do with the rapidly changing demographics of the state of Iowa, uh, but also with things happening on campus. Uh, and so this period from 2010 to 2014 uh, is the kind of greatest period of growth for Latino Latino students at Iowa, from 3.8% of the student population to 6.3%. That seems pretty impressive, especially when you think about Iowa, according to the most recent census data, having a 6.2% Latino Latino population. But when you actually start to dig into those data, again, humanities, Daryl, pretending to be a social scientist, you realize that when you're talking about the college age uh, folks in the state, Latinos and Latinos are actually a, a higher percentage, right? It's like 8.4%, uh, 8 8.5% basically of the 18 to 24 group, right? So when you factor that in, we're still pretty underrepresented um, at the University of Iowa. Um, but we do have this growth in the student population, um, and we also uh, and, and we see that continuing uh, to this to the present. Uh, we're at like 7.9 percent, I think, this year, still under where we should be if we want to talk about being representative. Um, but a few other th really interesting things start to happen in this period of growth. So when I get to Iowa in 2012, uh, there is the the kind of like the 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 occasion to have this uh, this Latina Latino Midwest Symposium. Uh, Larry, I think you were there. Were, were you there too? No. Um, but uh, it was, you know, a bunch of scholars were brought in, uh, people from the community too, to talk about Latinas and Latinas, Latinas and Latinos in the Midwest. Uh, following that symposium, the Latina Latino student population on campus was like, yo, we should have more of this kind of thing uh, and right, made demands of the institution. Right? And that's what actually got the institution finally saying, OK, let's do something about this. Um, and so two of the people who co-organized co co the symposium uh, quickly drafted up the minor, which was created in 2014. Um, one of those people, two of, two of the three people who did the symposium are no longer at the university. They, the university didn't retain them. Um, this is a constant 
refrain. Uh, so we were founded in 2014 as an interdisciplinary minor with a, a, who, that was institutionally housed in the history department, which was really awkward when that history professor left. Uh, we are no longer in the history department. We're now in the Division of Interdisciplinary Studies, um, or interdisciplinary programs, excuse me. Uh, and it, at the end of, uh, of, of spring of 2018, we achieved program status, which gives us a few more perks, like a lot more administrative work for the director. Uh, but it also gives us the ability to have lines in the program. Uh, and so uh, you know, in, in the last academic year, Rene Rocha, a political scientist, and myself uh, requested to have a quarter of each of our lines moved over to the Latino Latino Studies program. And so we are now officially Latino Latino Studies professors. Um, in 2018, we also uh, applied for a Mellon grant and received it uh, and started active recruitment um, of students kind of using that in part as a selling point. So we went from you know, two people in the spring of 2015, the first semester that we had the minor, uh, with kind of slow growth, and then last year took off, right? Doubled over the course of the academic year. Uh, and even with people graduating, we're still at about, we're above 50 people who with declared minors right now, which is great. Uh, that student population is, uh, largely Latina, Latina, Latinx, uh, but 90% underrepresented minority students, many of whom are first gen. Uh, a nice even distribution over the course of their kind of academic lifespan, uh, and all, really largely women. Uh, so 84% women. Um, I think uh, I have hypotheses about how to attract more Latino men into the program. Um, I think it partly has to do with the kinds of degree programs that they're in, uh, and not having, not exposing, getting exposed to Latino Latino studies. Um, and so there are ways that I want to try to remedy that. So quickly, current challenges that we're facing: one, recruiting and retaining faculty. Uh, this is the constant challenge uh, right now. You know, we, like I said, we, we're approaching eight percent Latino under graduate population at Iowa. The faculty is closer to 3%. Uh, when you're actually talking about Latino, Latino, Latinx faculty who do Latino, Latino, Latinx studies, um, well, there's two of us with parts of our lines in the program. Uh, there's another now, this year, three uh, who are affiliated with us. There's lines are 100% in other programs. And we've got one coming next year where a quarter of his line will be in the program. Uh, but that's what we're dealing with, right? And then we're just the kind of hodgepodge of some courses like the heritage, uh, Spanish for heritage speakers that count toward the minor because we needed courses to fill the minor when we formed it. Um, one of the, another challenge is meeting student, current student demand. Uh, our courses all fill and have wait lists, some of which approach the size of the course itself. Um, I'm, st I'm bad at uh, registrar math. I'm starting to get a little bit worried, especially when like Renee goes on sabbatical next year and isn't teaching that class that usually has 40 students in it. Um, are we going to have enough people to teach classes where students are gonna be able to finish their minor? I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'm hoping we can hire some more people to help fill that gap. Um, it's, you know, our institutionalization is second class. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to belabor that point, but I, most other program directors at the university get course releases for the work that they're doing. Um, they also have budgets. Uh, I was successfully able to argue for a budget as part of becoming director. So we have a, you know, a modest small $2,000 budget this year. Uh, so we can actually like invite a speaker to campus um, and almost pay for it, <laughs> almost. Uh, but you know, no course release or anything like that. Um, and the, moder the modern budget models are a disadvantage. I don't know about at Iowa State, but at Iowa we've moved to the responsibility center bud budgeting uh, that has been instrumentalized in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to be focused on student credit hours. In an interdisciplinary program where most of the courses aren't administratively housed in the program, that's eh, a bit of a problem, right? Even if, we've, even, if we, even if we double the size of the minor, if most of the courses aren't administratively housed in Latino and Latino studies, we don't actually get budgetary credit for it. Um, our opportunities, however, 
I hope outweigh those those uh, those constraints. So one is the demographics on our are on are on our side. To me, it's a no brainer. If we're talking about doing Latino Latino studies in the state of Iowa, like open a book, look around. There shouldn't be any question that not just to make the universities a better place for the Latina Latino students, right, which Latina Latino studies definitely does, but also to prepare the white students for a world that the university is not preparing them for right now. Like if you're going into the business world or the healthcare industries or education, you know, primary, secondary education, you need to have an education in Latina Latino studies in the state of Iowa and all of the surrounding states for that matter. Um, I think the Mellon Sawyer seminar that we're running uh, actively right now, which has a podcast, a film series, and six speaking events over the course of this academic year, bringing in about uh, over two dozen speakers, uh, is a great opportunity to, uh, to expose the campus community, the students, faculty, and administrators to the great work that we're doing. Um, and I, I recently found out, Larry, that uh, our president will be giving some opening remarks at the closing conference that you'll be speaking at. Uh, we're also starting, uh, starting next year, a Latina, Latina, Latinx student living learning community uh, that will be in one of the dorms. It'll be small at first, but I am hoping this will be a pipeline into the minor and eventual major. Um, central admin uh, and student services support Latina, Latino studies a lot, uh, even if the dean's office doesn't always. Um, and again, not to belabor the point, all the data are on our side. <laughs> Uh, so the future of Latino Latino studies at the University of Iowa um, is one that I think looks bright, uh, that, is for, that has to be grounded in more faculty and courses. So we're trying really hard. You know, there aren't many faculty lines being given out. And as people have mentioned, retirements don't get replaced. People who leave don't get replaced, et cetera. But they're really big on target of opportunity hires right now. Uh, and so we've been trying to position ourselves in relationship to other programs uh, to bring in faculty with ideally at least 25% in Latino and Latino studies uh, to fill the gaps. Like, we don't have a, so anyone doing sociology or anthropology, or art. Like, yeah, I'm like, like we need to like get on this. Um, uh, so we're working on developing an interdisciplinary major, one that I think would work really well as a double major. Yep, plenty of time. Um, and, uh, and working on recruiting students. You know, one of the things I really, I wanted to do a lot of this year was to recruit students into, uh, into the minor, to work with the deans and chairs of departments outside of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences as well, like in education, where, you know, the young people of the state of Iowa are increasingly, increasingly Latina, Latina, Latinx, right? Um, they don't have, yeah, it, it, they, I don't think the education schools are keeping up with that. Uh, and so, you know, so that's one thing that I hope to be doing. Um, and the, you know, really at the end of the day, there has to be also like support from the leadership of the college and the university. Uh, absent that, I mean, they're the ones who, who have the money. <laughs> Right, uh, and you know, absent that, uh, it's hard to grow, especially in in a, in a budget model that really isn't built for an interdisciplinary program. Uh, and so, my hope is that student pressure continues to prevail. Right, there's a strong demand from the students. Students are so engaged by Latino, Latino, Latinx studies, um, and you know, so my hope is we continue to grow in the way that we've been growing. But that's where we're at right now, five years in as a as a as a thing at Iowa. So thank you.